This episode is brought to you in partnership with the City of Cape Town. Find out more about their draft infrastructure strategy. Craig Kesson is Executive Director for Corporate Services at the City of Cape Town. The city recently discussed its proposal for an infrastructure strategy with business partners at the Cape Chamber of Commerce, an engagement led by the mayor. This conversation is to explain more about the thinking behind the infrastructure strategy. Craig, welcome. It's great to have you back on the show. Before we get into things, give us a brief introduction to your background and current role. I am an executive director at the city of Cape Town and also serve as the chief resilience officer and the chief data officer. For the past year and a few months, I have been working with city teams on the city's response to COVID-19 and uh, have also been working on the city's recovery efforts of what we do to stabilize and emerge from this pandemic moment. Looking at the current state of infrastructure services and delivery, how has the pandemic impacted infrastructure delivery at the city of Cape Town? The city's uh, infrastructure services were most acutely impacted by uh, COVID-19 in the sense of uh, firstly, a, a very direct material impact in the months of the hard lockdown and what immediately came thereafter. Uh, you must remember that during those uh, first few months, um, the city was only allowed to perform essential services. So really the core of our operations were allowed to operate and allowed to get along with the daily business of delivering services to residents. But what that meant was that uh, some of the tasks that are so instrumental to service delivery that pertain to infrastructure, such as maintenance, uh, servicing, um, uh, the sort of routine tasks of making sure that the long-term capital investment that allows infrastructure to be sustainably run uh, was uh, really paused for a good few months. And uh, when you are running a city operation of the scale of Cape Town uh, or any large metro in the country for that matter, uh, a delay of even a couple of days uh, has uh, implications for backlogs. It has implications for uh, resource needs. And so we really saw uh, quite a direct need uh, emerging from that. But then there was also the indirect effect. And the indirect effect was trying to deal with uh, the compound effects of the pandemic on service delivery, whether that was um, in adjustments to the services that we had to roll out, uh, changes to schedules, uh, the fact that <clears throat> some of our um, uh, personnel obviously were directly affected by COVID-19, um, either by getting it or uh, being potentially exposed to that. That also had knock-on effects for projects and operations. And also the um, surrounding industries upon which the city relies, uh, especially in capital intensive industries that had their own uh, impacts on operations. And so it really has been a, um, successive uh, wave of uh, numerous incidents that have come together to uh, create a, a quotient of um, infrastructure capacity need uh, as a result of the pandemic. Though we are still very much uh, in the third wave of the pandemic, let's talk about the road to recovery. What is the economic case for infrastructure investment? In as much as uh, we've been affected by the pandemic in those direct and indirect ways for infrastructure services, there's always been a strong case for investing in infrastructure, uh, especially at the local level. You know, the um, uh, I think that uh, there are numerous uh, economic uh, determinants that really motivate for making sure that there is hard infrastructure in the ground to deliver reliable services that uh, people know that they um, get what they pay for or can have a dependence on if the service is delivered for 
um, free or subsidized in some way by the city government. And really that has been the um, thrust of the city of Cape Town's uh, economic planning uh, for some time has been to try and get that reliability of our capital program and infrastructure services right. And I think that uh, where we come from and where we're going to in uh, this time of pandemic uh, also suggests that around the world, there is a case being made for um, infrastructure as being the basis of economic recovery, whether that is through hard investment through big fiscal stimulus, as you see in places like the United States currently debating and uh, indeed in places like China, or whether it's just making sure that you are getting your investments right, they are coordinated, there is a solid business case for a predictable project pipeline, uh, like we're seeing in places in, um, in Europe as well. Uh, that has been, I think, quite a common feature in talking about economic recovery from the pandemic. That is not necessarily contingent on or constrained by uh, when the pandemic um, ends or when we start to have a cycle of knowing uh, when we emerge from the pandemic. And I think that that's important because um, if you were going to constrain yourself by uh, thinking about, you know, a set linear point at which you can say, all right, now is the moment that we emerge from the pandemic. Now we can start thinking about recovery. Uh, I think that you would be uh, doing yourself a disservice. So the way that we've been thinking about it is let's assume that because of all of the uncertainties that are happening at the moment vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis our vaccination efforts, the uh, realities of variations of COVID-19 and how these interact, there is a working assumption that we have that it's still some time that we have to live with the realities of the pandemic, even as those realities change and we mature in our approach uh, to those changes. But uh, what that means is recovery starts with focusing on stabilizing yourself, stabilizing your operations, stabilizing your understanding of uh, where and how you want to invest in the long term and how you can react to these uh, transitory shocks that are coming from the long-term stress of the pandemic, or at least the medium-term stress. And there is, um, uh, on top of all of that, the fundamental public good that a public institution like the city government has in investing resources that it raises uh, mostly via public taxation, back into the economy, uh, reinvesting that cash back into uh, companies with a large, medium or small enterprises that uh, have their own supply chains, their own um, uh, employment of labor. Uh, we are a vital cog in creating and injecting economic activity uh, into the city. And there are the indirect effects, of course, of uh, making sure that the fundamental architecture on which an economy relies, the hard materials of roads, bridges, pipelines, uh, reticulation networks, bulk, that those are in place, they are being installed, and that uh, future economic growth actually has the fundamental underlying municipal infrastructure uh, that can sustain and um, be a partner to that growth. Let's talk a bit more about the thinking behind the infrastructure strategy. What is the scope and key elements of the city's infrastructure strategy and what's the implementation timeline? The city has obviously always been focused on infrastructure to, in one way or another, um, both as a unicity government from the early 2000s, but also all of the predecessor organizations and the mishmash of local government uh, authorities that there have been uh, over the years. Uh, so it's not unusual to talk about infrastructure and a focus on infrastructure and the fact that um, this is a core part of our business. What is new for us is uh, trying to make sure that we leverage our investment capability as a public institution, 
and that we have um, uh, as much internal transparency of the dependencies of projects that enable us to uh, fully leverage um, uh, that investment. And what I mean by that is there are numerous uh, big capital departments that uh, invest simultaneously uh, from the city into the, uh, into the economy every year. Uh, the question is whether we leverage uh, all of those investments, number one, are they going to the same place? Are they addressing the right backlogs? Are they focused on um, uh, meeting uh, a latent or active demand? Um, and moreover, is it efficient in the sense that uh, if there are these big departments uh, making these investments, are they suitably interlinked and cognizant of the dependencies with other city departments, with other um, uh, sources of compliance in the city? And we believe that um, the only way for us to truly utilize and have uh, realized the full impact of all of those different spending categories is to make sure that there is a focused attention on a set portfolio of infrastructure projects that tries to understand and map out all of these dependencies, but also create a reliable pipeline for the next decade in the very least. And I wanna just uh, touch on why that's important. The city uh, publishes every year um, three-year capital budgets. That's what the law requires of us. And to a certain degree, we engage in projects uh, that have a, a timeline longer than three years. In fact, relatively often. And there are stipulations in the law as to how we do that. Uh, but where we have had, um, uh, I won't say a shortcoming, but certainly a gap, is thinking about uh, what do all of the pipelines of projects look like beyond that three-year period to uh, a period of, say, 10 years? Now, we also have strategic planning documents that are based on five-year intervals. So, as I say, there is some contemplation of that. But uh, our focus has been on um, going beyond just strategic intent to actually programming formal portfolios of projects that project into the next 10 years what each service department will be focusing on and looking for the interdependencies within them. And that is what is new for the city. Uh, it's new in terms of the detail, it's new in terms of the specificity, and it also gives us a better sense of what our future financing requirements are. And so, uh, you know, when one is talking about or, or the leadership or the council debates uh, what the right taxation package should be um, for the coming year uh, or the next three-year cycle, uh, they can also be informed by what commitments we have in our infrastructure portfolio and where they need to make choices in order to match the projected revenue packet that um, the taxation scheme brings in. So it's, a, it's really trying to give life to um, a lot of strategic planning that's been done in the city in the past and actually translate it into um, uh, reliable programmed portfolios uh, where one can select projects in which to invest uh, and also be upfront about where projects rely on other departments or other projects or programs to make sure that we leverage that investment intelligently. And the benefit of that uh, for the external parties um, and certainly for the residents of Cape Town and those who seek to make their own investments in the city is that we would be able to point to a pipeline that gives a sense of where we are going uh, in the medium to long term in the city in a way that is reliable and that goes beyond, as I say, um, merely strategic language or indicative language that you would find in strategic documents to uh, project plans um, uh, that have a basis in reality. How is this strategy fundamentally different from previous capital programs? 
the uh, city has uh, had for some time uh, the publication of something called sector plans, um, which is where our big capital departments give their intentions for uh, certain incremental periods over time, whether it's 5, 10, 15 years, to try and give a direction for what their development impact in the municipal boundaries is going to be in the short, medium and long term. And the intention behind that is, uh, again, to try and give some sensibility to the resident of understanding where, uh, where and how the city is going to be shaped. And that obviously also has a, a, a theoretical benefit for uh, business, for um, uh, social stakeholders, for development and the like. Uh, what we have done in the past uh, 18 months to two years, and so preceding COVID, is actually placed a lot of focus and attention on trying to get um, technical projections and details of uh, sector plans uh, right. And what I mean by that is some of our sector plans in the past have been um, very good. Uh, some of them have been not as good as others. And uh, we wanted to get a uniform standard and that uniform standard uh, was designed around trying to understand what does future demand look like in our view and in the technical experts in the sector's view uh, look like. Um, what does uh, uh, the shift in consumer behavior and resident behavior look like? And how do we strategically respond to that? And then critically, what is the portfolio of projects that needs to be in place in order to enable that strategic response? And so what that is, is, is a, a, a teasing out of far more detail than we've ever had and actually creating a real-time proposed commitment to future projects to enable a strategic mandate or a strategic intent. Because the problem with the strategy document, as you will know, is that it can remain just that. It can remain a document that um, has little purpose uh, beyond interesting reading material. So locating it in real terms means translating it into project portfolios. And that's what our focus has been on for these past few months and, as I say, almost two years. And that package, you know, to give an example, because uh, uh, it's well known in the public domain, um, uh, in the instance of uh, our water sector, uh, the water sector plan will be based on the council adopted uh, water strategy, which uh, gave a projection of what a change in the uh, water sector and Cape Town's relationship with water needs to look like in the medium to long term. And so that has been obviously very carefully publicly vetted. And uh, uh, it is the articulation of that strategy that then falls the basis of uh, the sector plan and what the portfolio of projects look like in order to enable that sector plan. And then there is uh, you know, supporting detail of uh, uh, what does future demand look like with changing residents' uh, water usage patterns that emerged from the drought, you know, um, uh, uh, people have excellent new water behaviors in Cape Town, where they are far more conscious of their water usage or uh, utilizing different sources of water, recycling water in their homes. And so that has an impact on the nature of the utility. And so again, that also requires a strategic response. So the purpose of the technical plans um, and these technical sector plans is that uh, uh, when the moment comes for consideration for the residents of Cape Town uh, to consider their next five-year strategic plan, those technical sector plans also need to be published at the same time uh, in order to create uh, sector-specific contexts um, uh, for residents to apply their minds to, and indeed other stakeholders. And uh, um, I think that that is what is fundamentally different, is those uh, strategic documents are in a different class now to what they were in the past, and that is by design. And it is part of a very long-term push 
that we've had over many years to try and improve strategic planning in the city. And where it comes together quite nicely is that in this moment of the pandemic where uh, every cent counts, uh, not least in what we are charging uh, residents for the services we provide, but also the knowledge that you know, unlike a place uh, like the US or, or the EU, we uh, won't necessarily get uh, new tranches or new grants from uh, the national fiscus in order to uh, invest in new infrastructure. I'm not saying that's not going to happen, but I'm thinking about it in terms of uh, uh, the city's uh, standard budget. And so the one thing we can do is to be better with what we have and to do better with what we have. And um, uh, that's where the coherence of the infrastructure strategy really comes together to link all of these diff different sector plans and create that uh, consolidated portfolio. So during this series of episodes in partnership with the city of Cape Town, we've also done a, an episode with Mike Webster on the city's water strategy. So make sure to go check that out as part of the series. Does, does the strategy lock the city into existing service delivery models or enable innovation in alternative service delivery? Real commitments come uh, at budget time every year. Um, you know, even though there is a strategic portfolio over the next 10 years, uh, the portfolio or well, the purpose of portfolio management is to make decisions and adjust on the basis of risk and also on the basis of information or knowledge that comes to the decision maker's attention um, that maybe wasn't there at the conception of the portfolio. And indeed, projects and programs change uh, over time and uh, that's part of the ordinary course of events. So there is the really the annual process of review which articulates itself in the budget. And obviously the budget is uh, every year available for public comment. And so um, I think that there is uh, absolutely that year to year commitment. Um, and obviously that manifests differently for in-flight projects uh, where you would want to continue the commitment, um, uh, 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 especially if there has been um, an initial budget decision in preceding years. Um, but I think that uh, where we have some sense of change is one of the things that we would like the infrastructure strategy to do on an annual basis is indeed uh, explore options for alternative service delivery. And I don't necessarily know what all of those options are because it depends which service you're talking about and which service standard you're focusing on. But there is uh, definitely a resident behavior that I think is exciting and innovative that we need to be a part of and we need to factor into our policy and strategy choices to uh, support uh, viable alternative service models um, uh, insofar as, you know, they are compliant in our space and uh, accord with our overall objectives. But I say that because the uh, quantum of delivery over the next few years, the next decade, uh, and beyond that, uh, does uh, require the city to think about different ways in which services can be delivered. And remember that there's a service delivery model that has not necessarily been refreshed for changing in dynamic conditions. And those dynamic conditions um, include the fact that we have and continue to have, uh, and one of our strengths being an urbanizing population that is moving to the city, that has an expectation of services across all levels of the market. Um, and uh, we have to think about what is the most sustainable way to deliver services for everyone um, and at different sectors of this, uh, segments of the market. And where I talk about um, uh, Cape Townians having responded in exciting ways um, to changing service demands, I think that energy is a very good one. 
um, you know, because of the unfortunate realities of load shedding, uh, many households have um, explored alternative means of uh, sourcing their electricity, whether that is um, for those that can afford it, uh, some level of um, uh, solar power or PV power, uh, or even smaller scale generator or inverter capacities, or alternative sources of looking for energy su supply to the household or business, that is a response to uh, a changing utility reality um, in the supply of electricity. And the uh, city structure, and certainly the rationale for municipal electricity departments, was not really set up to contemplate uh, those alternatives. Luckily for us in the city of Cape Town, we made the decision a few years ago to think beyond just being um, a municipal electricity service provider and try and expand our thinking to the broader energy market, which is a journey we're still going on and have uh, very much more to do. Uh, but we've taken those positive steps. And that's what I mean by exploring alternative service delivery is uh, we need to be cognizant of those changes that are taking place. And we have to factor them into our business models, into our utility models, in order to ensure that we are sustainable for what the future needs are of our populace uh, and how they respond to those future needs. Because the alternative is uh, we don't make any changes and we pretend that it isn't happening until one day we realize that those utilities are unsustainable um, and they're archaic. And uh, that is the worst of all possible worlds. Um, and hence, uh, that logic of seeking alternatives is very much a big conceptual underpinning of the infrastructure strategy. To learn more about the city's energy and sustainability strategy, make sure to listen to the conversation with Kadri Nasip. What is the strategy's thinking around reaching low income and declining neighborhoods? Well, you know, the um, uh, big lesson that uh, we had to learn for um, COVID-19 is that uh, extending ourselves to communities that uh, for various reasons had been underserviced in some way required us to have some out of the box thinking. And that servicing uh, was not because of a lack of intent from the city government, but because um, of very good infrastructure reasons why some communities uh, could not be fully reached, whether they were on encumbered land or floodplains or the like. And so there had to be a level of creativity there. And I think that that spirit of creativity remains very much in the infrastructure strategy. And where we want to extend ourselves is in thinking about um, uh, where there are backlogs across the city. And um, there are uh, backlogs in both uh, historically served and uh, historically underserved communities. And part of the infrastructure strategy's thinking is to map all of that out uh, for decision makers using actually live data uh, that we get from our service request system to overlay with the engineering master plans and maintenance plans of the service departments to see are we matching where our supply of service delivery plans tells us where to go, i.e. Uh, this is where we think maintenance is required um, because the engineering plans tell us so. Uh, are we matching that against uh, the demand that we are seeing from all residents in the city where our service request system is um, uh, a very good barometer of where there might be consistent service delivery uh, complaints or uh, failures that sometimes have their genesis in uh, an infrastructure failure. And so one of the ways that we have tried to make sure that there is no area that is neglected in that service request system because not all parts of the city use it equally is uh, we have empowered city officials and city teams to go into areas um, uh, of the city that have not historically used our service request system 
and log uh, visible service delivery uh, uh, failures or service delivery issues to make sure that those communities are adequately represented on our data systems and that there are no data si uh, silences geographically across the city. Um, so that that demand side of the equation is now actually also being serviced equitably uh, in the logic of the infrastructure strategy. In the past few years, the city has been unable to spend its full capital budget. How does this strategy ensure capacity to actually deliver what is planned? Yeah, I mean, it's a, a, a perennial issue amongst capital intensive organizations is can you spend your capital budget? Uh, one thing I'll say about the city, and I think that the, the infrastructure strategy is a very nice evolutionary point on our capital spending journey, is that over the past decade, um, we have invested in systems, methodologies, tools to try and improve capital spending. And um, for the most part, that trajectory since around 2014, 2015 has been uh, an upward trajectory and not necessarily uh, uh, always consistently so. There have been uh, variations over that period, but the um, uh, net spend uh, has been uh, improving over time. And that's been because of uh, investments in uh, project management capacity, uh, engineering capacity in the organization, as well as um, uh, very big investments, especially in terms of time and focus on uh, uh, system enhancements. And by that, I mean, you know, just making sure that there is full visibility of um, all of the projects in the city at any one time, which uh, number in the thousands. Uh, having said all of that, we are still on our journey of um, uh, improving capital spend and, you know, every year we have a target that uh, we want to spend more than 90% of our capital budget. And I think that that's a reasonable target um, in project management terms to have that, you know, 10% buffer. Um, and with the billions that the city spends every year uh, uh, also is, is a reasonable amount. But where the infrastructure comes, strategy comes in is to say, in as far as we've taken that spending journey, there is still more road to travel. There is still improvements to make. There are still, um, uh, uh, there's still a direction to go in order to make sure that we do everything we can to consistently meet our capital spending targets. And we're not necessarily there yet, um, uh, but the infrastructure strategy uh, comes in to say, where are the real project dependencies for big spending programs? Where is the uh, where is the city's focus and attention most required to get behind to either unblock um, uh, certain impediments to delivery or to make sure that there is maximum coordination amongst uh, certain capital departments or to throw our weight uh, in terms of procurement assessment, contract management resources uh, behind those elements of our portfolio that can deliver the most for us. And uh, uh, that is um, a journey of, uh, you know, having the right skill sets in place, as I've mentioned, but it's also in using the incredible power of project uh, portfolio data that we have the backlog data that we have, the financial data that we have to bring it all together um, to make sure that those who are service delivery implementers and custodians uh, uh, have access to all of the different touch points that account for project success. And of course, think about that, you know, that um, so many big projects or programs have to go through a very complex machinery in local government or city government to be implemented. There's long lead times for procurement. There are very, very uh, detailed provisions for contract management. There's adjudication for, you know, which contract is the most expeditious to uh, um, oversee a particular project. Uh, what are the um, cash flow and financial requirements and budgeting requirements 
during the life cycle of the project. And, and as much as project management is always complex and always professional, these are additional complications. And um, uh, really what the infrastructure strategy tries to do is to say, if we set up a deliberate focus on all of these mechanisms of delivery and we triage our focus for those big points or those big delivery agents to make sure that we cluster the right resources and attention getting behind them, that ultimately is what we think can deliver better spending outcomes for the city. Thinking about implementation, what are the major barriers to the implementation of the strategy? There are many potential barriers. Um, uh, there uh, is, of course, the fact that we do have to work with uh, long lead times uh, in the city government. You know, it there is a a cycle between you know decision to pursue something strategically and when it can actually get out to the market, both in terms of the procurement as well as in terms of putting the contract in place. And depending on the nature of the project, um, those timelines can be extended. And uh, it's hard to maintain strategic focus and momentum when you are still technically in the, um, in the initial phases uh, before project is actually released for action and execution. So maintaining that momentum is difficult. What is also difficult is making budgeting choices, which obviously is ultimately for the council to make uh, based on the priorities of the day and informed by their constituents. But the point of a portfolio is you have to make choices within it. And there are solid motivations for just about every sector in the city to get uh, almost all of the resources that they request and desire. But one cannot meet that resource requirement in every instance. It's, it's not possible with how we are funded and uh, we're not going to get uh, some magical source of uh, new funding at that scale. And so the difficulty becomes in making the right choices uh, for the decision makers um, based on what the needs are and are you reaching multiple dividends in those choices that you make. So um, if you have to choose uh, a particular sector's uh, project because of a strategic necessity, have you created enough potential for other sectors to leverage off of that investment even if they are not um, the primary beneficiary of that financial or budgeting decision. And, uh, you know, um, there's numerous ways to think about that. It's a compound effect of the investment that you're making. You can search for the transversal connections. We are looking for uh, what is the most resilient way for us to make investments, i.e. if there's an outcome that we have to achieve in a particular sector with limited resources, what is the best way to prepare ourselves against future shocks and stresses um, by making the right choices within that portfolio or within that sector. But at the end of the day, in as much as we can have sophisticated prioritization frameworks, sophisticated resilience uh, analyses, and sophisticated uh, technical advice or assessments, those are ultimately hard decisions with limited resources that uh, decision makers need to make. And uh, uh, that is a complexity, if not a barrier to full delivery of the infrastructure strategy. How is the sector working with all industry stakeholders and what opportunities are there for collaboration? Well, I think that um, the first step has been uh, our leadership talking about the intention of this strategy coming down the track, which uh, has happened with certain stakeholders in the business sector. The, the next step is to have it um, that purpose, uh, I think, ventilated by the public leadership of the city. And then, of course, as I, I spoke about um, earlier, uh, is to publish those sector plans for the public to engage with and comment on, and that is across all sectors of society. And 
certainly uh, those moments will be coming in the next few months uh, and within the next year. Um, and every year uh, when the budget is published, that is also the moment for key engagement. But I think that part of the drive of getting this portfolio in place and visible is that ultimately when a partner approaches the city to collaborate or understand where the city is going, what it's investing in, the city has a coherent answer across all sectors with which it can respond. What are the main lessons taken from 2020 and the first half of 2021? Uh, and how can the city address them to not only survive, but to thrive in the future? I think that the biggest lesson for the city of the pandemic, uh, apart from its resilience and being able to um, uh, navigate the realities of the pandemic, which is ongoing, do so in a way that is uh, sustainable, that keeps the city above water, uh, is that the city is capable of tremendous action at a transversal programmatic level when circumstances require it. In the instance of 2020, in the first half of 2021, you know, the city had an incredible multi-department response to COVID-19 where uh, it built, you know, virtually a supplementary health system uh, in the city with uh, 39 um, uh, augmented health clinic sites um, for patients to be able to uh, access primary health care as well as um, uh, be streamed for uh, testing uh, or contact tracing uh, if they were presenting with uh, COVID-19 uh, symptoms so that we could allow the health system to uh, continue and to work. Uh, similarly, uh, there was the provisional of additional services uh, to uh, those parts of the city that, as I say, had uh, were very difficult to access for very good um, engineering and other reasons. Um, the city was able to uh, uh, marshal a service response to be able to accommodate the enhanced um, uh, uh, needs of uh, especially hygiene provision that were required. And uh, the constant engagement with other um, uh, parts of the state, especially at the provincial level, I think showed that where the city is understood to be good at its traditional sectors, it can also be excellent at uh, building bridges between those sectors and delivering trans transversal programs with speed, with great public effect, um, and with high impacts. And uh, uh, certainly, um, I think that the lesson of that model of delivery needs to translate into something like the infrastructure strategy, which will require that level of interdisciplinary transversal collaboration in order to make sure that we leverage all of those interconnections and interdependencies between projects, programs, and portfolios. Thank you for talking to us about the draft infrastructure strategy and the overall approach to infrastructure portfolio management. This draft strategy is undergoing consultations inside the city government and has been discussed at the portfolio committee, so we look forward to further updates. <music>